Good morning. Glad to see you all here. Appreciate our visitors also. This morning's lesson is the day of freedom. Um, I, I normally don't preach about the holidays. It's, it's mainly because I forget to develop a lesson before the day itself gets there. <laughs> it's just an oversight on my part. But I was sitting there earlier this week and thinking about it, and I said, well, I, I, I can do this. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 through 18. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The wrath of God. It's a huge thing to keep in mind. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2 there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and of death. Um, so the, it's the day of freedom, that we are freed from something in the context of Romans chapter uh, 1 there. It's the, it's the wrath of God. When one's day of spiritual freedom arrives, and you know, we talk about the you know, uh, uh, it's 4th of July, Independence Day. There are at least two things from which we are relieved. First one is our sin. Now, I'm not saying this is an exhaustive lift by any shake of the imaginations, but this is what I have down here. It's our sins and being washed away by the blood of, of Jesus. Acts 22, Paul says, And now why tearest thou, rise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. But what is it that washes our sins away? It's not the water. Revelation 1.5, John says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood. Again, in Romans, or Revelation 7.14, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, and it's John's been carried by an angel to a, in a vision, and he sees a crowd of people in white robes, white linen robes, and the angel says, thou, Knowest thou whose these are? John doesn't know. He said, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes. These are what they did. This is what they did. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Well, when did they do that? Well, Paul says in Acts 22, 16, when they were baptized, Now why tearest thou rise and be baptized and wash away thy sins? It's not the answer. It's not the washing away the filth of the flesh, 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. It's the answer for clear conscience. So the things that is washed in context is not our skin, is not our physical clothing, it's our spirits. They're washed away, they're washed from their sins in the blood of the Lamb. And in that process of being freed from our, the burden of sin, um, we are freed from God's wrath. Paul in 1 Thessalonians 1 says, and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So we're no longer under the wrath of God. Of all the people you could have angry with you, I would hope you'd understand it would, it would be best not to have God angry with, with you, which is the thing, because he's the one that really finally matters. So when what we gain in that process is beyond compare. Paul in Colossians 1.5 tells us, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Hope is the, the word that is, that, Paul, that is translated hope, that Paul used in the original language, means a confident expectation. For the confident expectation which is laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel? Well, how'd they know to have a confident expectation in the hope of heaven? Well, they heard about it in the gospel. It's the gospel, when it's obeyed, is what saves us from our sins. Again, as we saw in our verses just a moment ago. But the process is becoming aware of our spiritual condition precedes freedom. You know, if you don't know you're lost, then you don't know you're lost. Years ago, we were, when we lived in, um, in Kentucky, to get from where we lived in Kentucky to our home in Dayton, Ohio, you, U.S. Route 35 is almost a direct route. And so one early, early one Sunday morning, we left Dayton to get back 
in time for services Sunday morning down in, in Paintsville, Kentucky. And I'm driving along, got my earphones on, listening to something on my cassette tape. And I'm going down US 35 and suddenly none of this looks familiar. I've never been here before. So being this diligent young man that I was, I stopped and turned around and went, okay, everybody's asleep now, so I can't ask Jerry, where am I going? We went back. I do not, now, US 35 and, oh, I forget the US route that comes south that we were on, but it's, it's, a, it's like US 82 out here at 49, okay? US 35 and US 82 cross, and it's a big intersection. Line. I don't remember crossing the intersection. I don't know if I stopped. To this day, I don't know. So, oh, well, I was lost, and then I was found because I turned around <laughs> and figured out where I was. So until you know you're lost, you don't know what to do. You don't know to turn around. Romans 3 and verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's nobody that's, of, that's, that's reached the age of accountability, that's of su sufficient age and mental capacity to know the difference between, between right and wrong. When you reach that point, you then become either a servant of righteousness or a servant of darkness. There's no two possibilities. But we learn that sin is transgression of God's law. That's what, what John says in 1 John 3, 4. Sin is transgression of God's law. There is a standard that all men everywhere at all times and every place on the globe since the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 are accountable for. Now, just as an aside here, people aren't lost because they don't obey the gospel. They're lost because they transgress even their own conscience. And they transgress, and they seriously transgress, or are sinners because they transgress the law of Christ. So we've done things, each of us have done things we, we know, we sh oh man, I shouldn't have done that. I was wrong for having done that. And not just a matter of opinion, you shouldn't have done that, you know, that kind of thing. 1 John 3, 4, sin is transgression of law, for which all are now accountable. In Acts chapter 17, 30 and 31, Paul preaching to the, the, the uh, philosophers on Mars Hill, he talks about uh, Jesus being resurrected from the dead, and then he commands all men everywhere to repent. Well, all men everywhere. Who's left out of that, and what place is left out of that? Well, no man, no place. It's all men everywhere. They've all been commanded. We've all been commanded to respond to the gospel. Again, Mark 16, why did Jesus tell the apostles to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature? Well, because they needed to hear the truth. They needed to hear that which saves them from the burden of their sin. So their conscience can be washed clean in the blood left. Nobody knows how to do that. Nobody knows to do that until they've been told the truth. Now, we know we've done wrong, but we just don't know exactly what it is we've done. Now, practicing lawlessness, again, 1 John 3, 4, sin is transgression of the law, is that which cuts us off from God. Isaiah 59, the prophet tells us, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your sins and your, iniqu but your, sin but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So it's what we have done is that which separates us from God. It's our transgression of his law that comes between us and our God and him hearing us. Doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that he doesn't know we're asking him for something. It's like when your kids were little and you're standing there in line at Walmart or someplace like that and they got all those racks right there at, at, the, uh, checkout, at the checkout counter and, and all, oh, it's just filled with candy. And they're tugging on your pant leg or your skirt, ladies. Mama, mama, daddy, daddy, mama, mama. What? Can I have some candy? I told you no. Now, you don't, they keep tugging and pulling and wanting and touching and pointing. And you're ignoring them. Do you know they're tugging on your pant leg? Yes, you do. Do you respond? No. Well, unless you reach down and flip their head for them. But you don't give them the candy because you told them no. But you know, okay, God knows what we want, what we're doing. But we must become truly aware of the consequences. In Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says, Not everyone says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Now, if I'm not doing the will of his Father, doesn't matter how good of a person I am, I'm not going into the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's, now that's just what Jesus said. I, you know, I, don't know what, I don't know how you argue with that. 
Matthew 25 and 46, at the end of uh, Jesus' account of what the judgment scene is going to look at, look like, and he's got sheep and goats separated right and left, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, talking about the goats, but the righteous into life eternal. Now, it's interesting, just as long as punishment in hell is, is just as long as glory in heaven is, and just as terrible as being in hell will be, it will be just as glorious as being in heaven will be. Absolute contrast with one another. One's going to be just terrible and beyond compare, and the other one's going to be wonderful beyond compare. You know, so it's, 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 a, it's something that the scriptures talk about, and don't leave it in doubt. I mean, if you doubt it, then it's because you haven't read or understood what you've read. If you haven't read it, or if you have, and you still have doubts, it's because you haven't understood what you've read. But in the second place, being willing to not only listen to, but consider information is critical. You know, why preach the gospel so people understand what it is, what it is they've done and how they fix it? It always drove me crazy when a preacher said, stop sinning. Well, what do I do? Just, just repent. Well, okay, well, what, what does that mean? And what do, how do I, if I'm supposed to repent, what is that? Tell me how to do that. Give me, you know, I'm, I'm a believer in steps. You know, give me instruction sheet. One, two, three, four. Do this, this, and this. You know, I'm, I like a recipe. Don't, don't tell me what it is. <laughs> Hand it to me. And say, here, do this. Okay. So that's what we have. We must have our hearts in the right place. Now, I don't mean our blood pumps. I don't mean that muscle right there in the left center of your chest. Isaiah 29, 13. Now notice the thread in all these. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near with me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart, they have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Well, why do you fear God? Well, we've just always done it that way here. That's no reason to do anything. Ezekiel chapter 33 and they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people. Didn't say they were. Said as my people. And they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. Where's your treasure? And lo, thou art unto them as, as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear their words, but they will not, but they will do them not. Oh, isn't that great sermon preacher? As they shake your hand going out of the building. I preached a gospel meeting up in uh, Johns Creek, Kentucky years ago. And this, this, this series of lessons was on the church and how the church behaves and so forth. And there was a what's called a conservative Christian church. They called themselves the Church of Christ, but they weren't instruments of music and I, that night I just happened to be preaching on instrumental music in worship and uh, boy, I, I just there's no misunderstanding <laughs> what the scriptures required and and uh, you know I, I just absolutely condemned instrumental mechanical instruments of music in a worship assembly and as I'm walking out of the building every one of those fellows well, those folks from the Fli the Philippi I think they call themselves the Philippi Church of Christ shook my hands my hand as they walked good sermon preacher we needed that didn't do them a bit of good, you know. They heard the words, but they just just basically said, "That's just basically your opinion." Then in Matthew 15, ye hypocrites, well did he say, "As prophesy of you, this people, this people draw from my enemy with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me." But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. See, that's the point. I, I can do everything I think is right, and everything we've been told to do is right. But until I open up and have a book, chapter, and verse for what I do to authorize me to do what I do or to leave off what I'm leaving off, then I'm not walking in light in any sense of the word, of the phrase as, as it's used in the Bible. So what's the necessary mindset? What sh how should my, my mind be or the mind of anybody? How should it be when it approaches the truth? Well, again, in Acts chapter 2, we find the, from Luke's hand, then they that gladly received his word. Now, there are 3,000 folks that's being talked about here. 
But how many extra thousands of people were there to hear that truth? They all received it, but only 3,000 gladly received it. How do you know? Well, first of all, it says that, but gladly received it. Notice what he goes on and says. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine fellowship, breaking bread and prayer. So there's a whole lot of people that received it, that didn't receive it gladly, and as a consequence of not gladly receiving it, they weren't baptized. Now, in all fairness, I'm sure I'd be, actually, I don't, I'm not sure, I would be surprised if there weren't people in that audience going, you know what, I get what he's saying. We need to think about this. We need to sit down and talk about this, and a bunch of them getting together and talking about what they just heard. I'm, I would even go so far as say some of them, like those folks, I guess it was in Berea, that got out the scrolls and so, checked whether these things were so. Let's just get out the Bible, and let's just see if that boy's got it right or not. And they looked up Scripture. And st- I mean, I don't, again, I don't know. That's conjecture on my part. But I would have to say that there's probably some of them like that. But, you know, I want to hear, well, in Athens, we want to hear some more about this. That's an, that's an honest heart, too. But they hadn't yet gladly received it. They were kind of iffy on the glad part because they understood the consequences. And then in Acts 17 and 32 is where it says, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. Well, you know, I appreciate that. I appreciate somebody wants to have more information. They're asking questions. They may be, they may be in, 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 in a very, rather vocal disagreement, but as long as the conversation goes on, you have a prospect. You have somebody that's, that's interested on some level in what you have. Because they've seen s- at least some value in what you're presenting. And that's what we're looking for, inquisitive minds. It then becomes an ongoing process of discipleship. Once somebody is glad to receive the word and obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine delivered, it then becomes an, oncoming, an ongoing process. And they continued steadfastly. Again, Acts 2 and verse 42. Study the show thyself approved unto, unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of two, truth, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. Walking in the light as he is in the light, 1 John 1 and verse 7. So it's, it's a process. It's not, it's not getting on the bus and having your ticket punched and everything's okay at that, from that point on. That's not it at all. It is an ongoing process. In the third place, it is a truth that sets us free. But not just because somebody's heard it. In John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, then said Jesus of those Jews which believed on him. Now they believed on him. If, but, he, but notice the conditional statement. He says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. That's a, that's a if-then statement. That's a, that's a logical progression there. If you do this, then this follows. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's somebody that accepts the, what they've heard and what they've studied as the truth. They respond to it appropriately, initially, and then they continue that process of learning more and more and more as they go along and adapting themselves to the truth so that they become more Christ-like in the bargain in that process. It's an, ongoing, it's an ongoing effort. John 12 and verse 48. Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. We've been given the test sheet with the answers. It's, what we've, it's what's happened. The teacher said, here's the test and here's the answer sheet. Now study it. And I, I had a, my civics and social teacher, Mr. O'Brien, in high school, he, he, overhead projector, he had the outline, and he went down the outline, and he covered the outline. And then on Thursday, he put the same outline up on the overhead projector, and he underlined the test questions. So there are some people who failed that class. I, I'm, I'm stunned. They didn't underline, they didn't study. All you had to do was just memorize, just memorize the portion of the sentence that, that had the underline in it. And your goal. They wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. Now, on the day of judgment, there's going to be people saying, what? What, what do you mean I'm lost? Why am I over here with all these goats? 
you lost. But, 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 no, no, it's not going to work. And then uh, John 17, 17, Jesus says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So it's through the word that we are sanctified. Again, again, according to the Lord himself is, is, is what that is. Now, so we are justified by and our faith made perfect through works. Now, we have to be careful with this as, as we, we look at this. John cha or James chapter 2, verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So just belief isn't going to cut it. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified? By the way, what works did Abraham do that justified him? He got up and left Ur the Chaldees to a place he was told to go. He offered his son Isaac, his only son, when he was told to offer his son, Genesis 22. And when he got done, and, and of course God told him not to and gave him the ram, he said, now I know. Now, 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 that, now that you've almost done what I told you to do, and didn't hesitate, now I know. That's what he said. That's what God said. Was not our father Abraham justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works that God told him to do? And by works was, was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which said, Saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend, the friend of God. Do you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only, not by works only. We're not saved by anything only. We're not even saved by the blood of Jesus only. Because if you don't believe that Jesus shed his blood for the remission of your sins, why would you be baptized? Why would a faithless person be baptized? Well, he wouldn't be. He might get in a tank. He wouldn't be baptized. He'd just be gotten wet. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had and, and sent them out another way. She was told to hang that red rope out the window. She's told to have everybody in her house. And she's told not to say anything to anybody. There's three, three things she had to do. Hang out the red rope or the red string. Not say anything to anybody. And have everybody want to be saved in her house. If she left off any of those, she wouldn't have done what she's told to do. So there were things she had to do. Which one, question, which one of those things could she leave off? And still expect to be saved. Well now, I'm going to what the scriptures say. Thread, keep your mouth shut, have your family inside. I, that's, you would think that's not that hard to do. But Then verse 26 says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. If you're not doing the things you're told to do by the Holy Spirit, then I don't care what you believe. Actually, we do know what you believe. You don't believe you have to do anything you're told to do except what you feel like you have to do. Now, not just any works. I want to, be, I want to stress this. Not just any works. Notice Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath ordained, appointed, that we should walk therein. Now, again, the question is, what, back to the, the rope and the keeping your mouth shut and staying in the house, Bring that same thought forward to today. Which of the commandments of Jesus could you leave off? I don't have to do that. We don't do that today, or whatever reason you give, and still expect to have salvation. Me, I'm going with doing what Jesus said to do. Now, that's just me now. I'm going to do what the Lord said to do. Because I want what he's offering. Now, that, again, that's just me. Luke 17 and verse 10. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded, you say... We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. So when I've done everything I've been commanded to do, I have no right to say anything to anybody and say, look at me. I've just done what I was told to do. You know, I, I, I go to work for somebody. He says, Gene, this is your job today. Do these five things. These five things. Do the one, two, three, four, five. Don't care the order. Just do, you got these things to do. Do these things. And this will probably take you all day. All right, I do those five things. Now, I might get done by noontime. And Jerry comes in and says, well, Hill, did you get it done? Sure did. What are you doing just standing there? Well, I got them done. Already? Yeah. Okay. Give me a raise. Okay. 
So, the things that he's commanded to do, which God ordained, so again, like I said, which God ordained work, and which I am to walk by his commandments, can I leave undone and still expect salvation by grace through faith? We're not saved by grace alone. We're not saved by faith alone. We're not saved by the blood of Jesus alone, by itself. How do I, how do I contact the blood? How do I know the blood of Jesus exists? How do I know how to come in contact with it? Until I've heard the gospel priest and, and do what I'm told to do to contact the blood of Christ. How do I know to do it? Well, you don't know how to do it. Well, so what does Jesus say? Jesus said here, John 6, 44 and 45, Jesus said, They shall all be taught of God. He that hath heard and learned of the Father cometh unto me. Now, what if I don't hear? What if nobody comes and preaches to me? Or I don't have a Bible to read? So nobody says anything and I have nothing to read. How am I going to find out about the gospel plan of salvation? Well, I, I'm not. I don't, I don't know the third possibility, opportunity. I then have to believe what I've been told. Jesus said in John 8 and verse 24, except you believe that I am he, in context of John chapter 8, the Messiah, the anointed one, except you believe that I am he, you should die in your sins. So I have to be taught, John 6, 44 and 45, about Jesus, John 8 and verse 24, in order to believe about him, in order to believe in him, rather. That's a lot of teaching. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, I tell you, nay, except you repent, ye shall likewise perish. So I'm told what the truth is, that Jesus is the Christ, that I have to repent of my sins. These are all the comments by Jesus, by the way. I then have to confess him, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. I tell you, nay, except you confess me before men, I will not confess you before my heavenly Father. I think that's a pretty big deal. Uh, have you ever filled out a resume and it asks for for references, and you're always careful about the references you put. I learned that earlier. You're careful about the references you put down. You're always going to put down a reference that gives you a rosy. Re oh man, greatest thing since front pockets. We we tried to keep him. We offered him more money and just all kind. But he was he was one to go to work for you. So you need to hire the boy. Okay. You don't put. Oh man, I don't know. We couldn't get him to show up. You don't want to. No. You don't put that fella on there. You put the rosy reports on there. So. You want the Lord to confess you to the Heavenly Father because you've done what the Lord said to do. This is one of my servants. He's been washed in my blood. I, ref I, 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 I recommend him to you for your, your approval. I'm baptized, Mark 16, 16. Jesus said, he that believes and is be believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned or is damned already, depending on your translation. But, it does, but, but notice it says, he that believeth not. Well, now why does it say that? It's just simply reiterating the fact that a non-believer isn't going to be told, isn't going to do what he's been told to do. I don't believe I have to do that. We don't do that around here. Well, we've never done that here. Okay. Well, that's just what they did back then, but we don't do that today. Why? I, I, I get that. I see that. My question is why? When I can read what Jesus said, and it's in red, okay, got a red letter edition Bible, and I see where Jesus has said all of these things, which one of those things could you take your pencil and scratch out as something you don't have to do? And why? If you're going to scratch it out, why? If it's what the Lord said, it's what the Lord said. And notice the last point I've got down there is faithfulness. Revelation 2 and verse 10. Jesus said, be thou faithful unto death, I'll give unto thee the crown of life. So I have to be faithful up to and including the point of my death. There I am, out there in the middle of that Colosseum, the Roman Colosseum, and everybody's got their thumbs turned down. And the gates open up, and here comes a bunch of lions and tigers and bears, literally, that they haven't fed for a while. And they see me and you and the rest of our family standing there in the middle of that arena, and they're thinking, lunch. And here they come. And all I have to do is just say, ho, oh, ho, I quit. I don't believe, I believe Caesar is Lord. That's all I, that's all I had to say. 
And by the way, they, they've actually found in ruins someplace, one of those, in Revelation, it, it talks about um, having the approval of the Roman government. I have to look up the exact verse, but there's actually, there's actually a, 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 a plaque, a, a, a certificate that, that said Gary Free offered a pinch of sacrifice to Caesar on, August, on July the 4th, whatever. It's actually down there. It's actually, there's actually a certificate. They found something like that in a ruin somewhere. So if you didn't have one of those, you couldn't go down to Walmart and buy groceries. You couldn't get a job. Your, your guild, your, your electronics teacher guild would kick you out if you didn't uh, you know, accept Caesar as Lord. You couldn't work. You couldn't buy groceries. Uh, you'd lose your land. Uh, you'd, you'd lose everything. It'd be tough to live. But Jesus said, be thou faithful in death, and I'll give unto thee the crown of life. If they kill me, that's what, the worst they can do is kill me. Now, they can might drag that thing out for a while, but the worst, in the, final, in the final analysis, they're going to kill me. And by the way, point of faith for you, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Paul said that uh, God will not lay anything on us. Let me just turn to it and read it so I get it right. I don't want to misquote it. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. He says, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Now, I can't think of anything worse than watching one of my family members be murdered in front of my eyes. But yet, it, it may be that they get a quick death, and then I, my death follows to relieve me of the burden of, of breaking it. Because the Lord knows what my limits are. So there's a point of faith here, brethren. We need to trust the Lord to keep his word. So I obtain my freedom from self and sin when I obey from the heart and in the process becoming a servant of righteousness. Romans chapter 6, 1 through 4. Looking at that just so it's before us, Paul says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin? This is repentance right here. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should rise to walk in newness of life. So we have the death, burial, and the resurrection pictured of Jesus, pictured in our, in our being baptized. We have died to self. We have been buried in the water grave of baptism. We resurrect to walk in newness of life, just as Jesus did from the grave. Now I'll drop down to, Rome, to uh, verses... Uh, 16 through 18, he says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield servants to obey his, his servants yard, to whom ye obey, whether of sin and the death, or of obedience and righteousness? Well, to what am I yielding? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Well, what's the doctrine? 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, the doctrine is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's the gospel. The form of it is in verses 3 and 4 of Romans 6. It's our own death, burial, and resurrection. In the water gave a baptism. I repent of my sins, I die to self. I'm, I bury the old man of sin in the water grave of baptism, and I rise to walk in newness of life. That's what Paul is teaching there. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, past tense, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, and notice this. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. When was I made free from sin? Well, Acts 22, 16. And now, why tarest? Arise and, be, arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Paul says, when I do that, I've, I've been made free from my sin. What is it that makes me free? Well, you believe in water salvation. No, I don't. I absolutely oppose that, the blasphemous doctrine. I believe in salvation being washed in the blood of the Lamb. But the question is, is when am I washed in the blood? Paul says, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, when I am baptized. Acts 22 and verse 16. Now, the Holy Spirit tells us, tells me it is the blood of Jesus that sanctifies me. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 12. He says, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify his, the people, rather, with his own blood, suffered without the gate. 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23. Seeing ye have purified your souls, in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another, 
with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, John 3, 3 through 5. Born of water and the Spirit. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. What did Jesus say? Sanctify them through thy truth. What? Thy word is truth. So when I obey from the heart the form of doctrine delivered that I heard about in the word of the truth, when I do what the Spirit says to do to achieve the ends projected, the salvation for my sins, I am saved from my sins and the blood of Jesus. That's freedom. That's independence from self. Because I have crucified the old man of sin. I have died to self. Paul, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of Man who loved me and gave himself for me. You can't beat that. That's salvation. That's the plan. You know, like I said at the beginning, man, give me the rules. Tell me what it is I have to do to play this game, to play, to do what it is I'm supposed to. Tell me what it is I'm supposed to do. He has, very plainly. If you want independence from self and sin, do what Jesus said to do. And then continue doing that. If you're not a child of God, we invite you to become one. By obeying the thing, just do what Jesus said to do. Hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, being baptized, beginning a faithful Christian life. If you've done that, then God's second law of pardon, first, and 1 John 1, 6 through 10, about walking in the light, is if, if we recognize we have committed a sin, we confess that sin to God, Romans, or, excuse me, 1 John 1, verse 8 and 9, we confess it to Him, and He's promised to forgive us of our sins. Well, I'm going to take him at his word. Now, I have a hard time with forgiving myself, but I trust God to do that. You know, I'm just a weak human being. I trust God to forgive me. He said he would, so I'm doing what he said to do to have that. So, if you're not a child of God, become one. If you are, but you've been unfaithful, we, we encourage you to come back. Ask God's forgiveness and come back. Repent of your sins and return it. If there's something we can do, pray for you, study with you. You know, I don't know what, what you need. You have to tell us. But we invite you to come while together we stand and sing the hymn of invitation.